Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. Hey, it's William, and welcome to today's episode of the Catalytic Leadership Podcast. Each week, we tackle a topic related to the field of leadership. My goal is to ensure that you have actionable steps you can take from each episode to grow in your own leadership. Growth doesn't just happen. My goal is to help you become intentional about it. Each week, we spotlight leaders from a variety of fields, organizations, and locations. And my goal is for you to see that leaders can be catalytic no matter where they are or what they lead. I draw inspiration from the stories and journeys of these leaders, and I hear from many of you that you do too. Let's jump in to today's interview. I'm excited today to have Tyler Hornsley on the podcast. After Tyler's career as a U.S. federal officer, having worked for two government agencies and a military contracting group, Tyler founded Nuclear Networking, a business growth agency created in 2010. Tyler grew that organization to over $5 million in five years and ranked top 5% in the nation on the Inc. 5000 list. He sold that to a private equity group in which he is now a partner. Now, while running Nuclear Networking, Tyler has funded, grown, consulted, marketed, and sold several other companies, including a federal court reporting firm, a luxury retail product store, and many more. With years of M&A experience, Tyler focuses solely on business growth strategies for companies that he buys, builds, consults, and sells. Tyler also has a strong passion for philanthropy. He currently sits on several boards and acts as an advisor for several impact companies and believes in leveraging his skill sets and network to rapidly increase the standards of living for humans around the world. Tyler, it is such an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I would love for you to share some of your story with our listeners. I just hit the high points. I'd love to hear more about <laughs> your journey and your development as a leader in particular. How did you get started? Sure. I got started. I actually changed careers. Uh, first career was in federal law enforcement. So worked for Department of Homeland Security, IRS, and a military contracting firm. And somehow made the leap to marketing <laughs> and advising. <laughs> And so genuinely, though, I, I, I do, I always enjoy the idea of exclusive knowledge and then, you know, pairing that with computer savviness and, and some acumen around, we'll just call it investigations. Um, it, it actually pairs pretty nicely with um, market and competitor research, right? So able to kind of see a little bit deeper uh, behind the veil as to what people are doing on a marketing front and then re-strategize uh, what we can do uh, to basically win you know, yeah. in those spaces. And so that's kind of the the context or, or maybe more of my DNA and how I'm built and how that's transferable throughout different, you know, different exercises or industries. So I left um, the federal law enforcement career, started nuclear networking. It's a stereotypical garage basement story, right? I started with a couple of partners, did the ramen thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we were profitable because we didn't pay ourselves. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> um, since day one, we were profitable, but, um, grew that basically took, you know, a year and a half to get that off the ground to the extent that we could actually do that full time and make a living. And, um, also look, you, you had mentioned it right during the welcome, the high points aside, massive amounts of pain, stress, uh, failure, you know, and, and relentless, restarts and so you know one of the three partners at that time we actually figured out that one of the core product sets wasn't a good market fit in terms of scalability it was highly highly customizable and um through other life circumstances well we actually had to part ways uh which which sucked right because that's that's a it was a good friend and and i'd still consider that person a friend uh but in the startup world it's when you're really scrappy, you, get, you know, some of those decisions, life decisions too. It's not just about the business. It's like, do I want a family? Do I want to get married? You know, all these things are coming into play and, and then there's out, you know, external pressure. And so there's certainly difficulties around that. There's been difficulties around, you know, just the growth of the company in general. Um, we started out 
basically just selling traffic, right? Mm. I call it traffic driving services, but anybody, any listeners out there listening, like what is, you know, digital marketing or growth advising, two different things. Like a lot of people think of digital marketing, they think of SEO, SEM, all these acronyms, and, and they're primarily driving traffic. And, and while that's good, it also heavily relies on the user having a website that converts with a clear story and value so customers understand what they're doing. And then it also requires them to answer their phone, follow up with leads. You know what I mean? So like yeah. there's tons of variables outside of our control. Uh, and so, yeah, fast forward, you know, building and selling nuclear to the private equity firm where I work now, we were able to basically acquire more skill sets and, and now we're able to do full funnel you know, mm -hmm. advice, creative and sales automation, as well as traffic. So, so that's helped, but that took like seven years. <laughs> you know, what? Like, it wasn't overnight. I it know, wasn't an yeah. overnight success. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I didn't, um, everybody's got their own path. I didn't, I never taken out loans, anything like that. It's just really scrappy behind a computer uh, type of a startup, but using the business growth expertise that I've learned and in learning how to acquire other companies through the M&A space that you referenced as well, has helped me substantially. I've been able to build and sell other companies um, using the same skill sets I learned here. So, wow. Yeah. What it's a journey. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so given your, your varied background, I mean, from Homeland Security and the IRS, right, yeah. to M&A and the entrepreneurial space, how would you define leadership? Uh, a couple of things come to mind. So servant leader is big for me. And that's even prior to business. That's just kind of how, you know, values that my family kind of instilled. That's really important. It's like, for one, leaders are just people who go first, usually. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have everything figured out. It just means that they're willing to go first, uh, whether it be off a cliff or to paradise. Um, but <laughs> servant leadership as well. There's different leadership styles. And, and mine has certainly not been perfect at all. It's It constantly evolves as I learn over the years. Um, but some people have a dictatorial, you know, leadership style and, and others have a really passive leadership style and they just get run over and they wonder why things go wrong because they're not holding their staff accountable. And so there's something in the middle there where it's living by example. And not only just that, but also augmenting uh, your leadership and your scalability with methodologies like scaling up EOS, you know, something like that where people can have a published aligned vision. It's not just in Tyler's head, it's actually on paper and everybody knows where we're going and what we're doing and the why. And then they have individual scorecard metrics. So it's not about emotion. It's about, did we hit these numbers, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. And so I, I'd say, you know, leadership is, it is that, but it's also, I think, the ability to augment people around you that have skill sets and strengths that you don't. So I guess it's realizing where you're not great. That's true leadership because everybody knows, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the person in the room is like, I'm amazing. I know everything. And they're like, this guy doesn't even know how to do my job and he's trying to manage me. So <laughs> it's I, I think it's just being vulnerable and, and having, you know, that emotional intelligence and yeah, uh, enough to just be real with people and say, hey, I'm a real human. This is where I suck. This is why I've hired people who do well here. So, yeah. So what has helped you to to raise awareness of your own blind spots like that as you have led? Yeah. So I was just uh, recently started coaching and ended up being coached. And I haven't ever done that. I mean, not in an official capacity, what I would say is I've gotten tremendous amount of value through mentors, which I can dive in later um, and, and even maybe close with, because that's been one of my most important pieces. But the most value and where I've grown more in leadership hasn't been for me personally, or it didn't start with reading leadership books mm -hmm. and, and doing this leadership, like let's pump everybody up and let's, let's live this role or fake it till you make it. Yeah. It actually, my journey is probably different than a lot of people's, but having come from federal law enforcement where you ask and then you tell, and then you make, mm -hmm. it's very different in the business world. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, so, right. yeah. So for me, that was also a reflection. Like I, I'm a, by nature, a little bit mischievous and 
uh, use use it for good. That's kind of what I say, but kind of creative on rethinking, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I needed to kind of be broken. <laughs> yeah. To, so, so here's the summary so I don't get off track here. Instead of focusing on how to control or manage everyone else, I had to first look inwardly, like, where am I broken? Where am I lacking? Where does that come from? Like, what's underneath that? Because it's not enough to, at a surface level, just lazily claim, oh, I'm not that kind of person. I'm just not going to be organized. Or I'm not that kind of person. You know, I don't want other people in my business. It's like, well, what's underneath that? Well, is it insecurity? What's underneath the insecurity? Where does that come from? And so... It, it was pretty deep work. So there's a group called Crucible. I went to one of their weekends um, and it's essentially, hey, the leadership mask you wear, the friendship mask, the family husband mask, we're going to rip it off. I'm like, mm-hmm. this sounds wonderful. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was not, but it was it was helpful because it's like, if you don't know yourself and you're not introspective and you don't have any emotional intelligence, it's going to be really challenging for you to understand anyone else's perspective other than your own. Mm. By the way, what I've just summarized there is called ego and ego <laughs> can't understand anything greater than itself. And so yeah. it's important to destroy that to, to understand because once you're there, then you can kind of start seeing yourself in other people or understanding what's underneath that for them. And then turning that around and, and ideally moving there from fear to motivation and so that's helped me more than anything just being able to see different perspectives instead of just my own I, I know tons of leaders and they're successful but it's their way or the highway and their god in their own life and it's like yeah. man like you're you know there's a lot of damage that comes with that and I just think that those types of people if they're already that good imagine if they polished even further how much better they could be right if they were sensitive to how other people actually thought so hmm. That's good. I like that. <laughs> you have a lot of experience consulting and helping to grow business, not just yours, but other people's as well. And I, I think there are a lot of people listening who that would be a question they would like to ask you. Like if there's if there's one thing that you would recommend that somebody do to grow their business, what would that one thing be? I... It's, it's almost kind of like a recipe is what I've gotten it down to versus just run digital marketing or do X or do Y or do Z. Yeah. One of the, uh, before you spend money on anything, <laughs> thinking is more important. And so things that I ask people to think deeply about are if you had the opportunity to speak to 50,000 people ready to buy your product or service right now, you're the luckiest person alive. They're all listening. And you only had 10 seconds to tell them why you're better than their than your competitors, what would you say? And it can't be, you know, we've been in business for 30 years and we're really great. And we will totally call you back, or we have a triple A score on the Better Business Bureau. It's just noise. And so think in terms of objective-driven marketing. What is the objective when somebody comes to your website or meets you? Are you only talking about yourself? We do roofing. Okay. But what are you solving for them? Yeah. And 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 then once you've found out the pain point, what is the objective that that you're telling them? Like if a five-year-old or your grandmother can't understand what to do once they get to your website, you're doing it wrong. Like you have less than 10 seconds. We're we're constantly thrusting into a future where people have less and less attention span. And so to be able to cater and they get advertised to 16,000 times plus a day. So it's like, you really have to be able to stop them from scrolling and, and look at you and then immediately want to speak with you. It doesn't mean that they need to buy, but catch, catch their attention through value, not just shock value. Cause we, that's media and politicians. I'm talking like real value. Like I can help you and I'm willing to do so for free, or I'm willing to take the first step forward. You don't have to, you're not going to get this from any other company. Let's, let's start a relationship. And so I could certainly go down the rabbit hole on examples of, of those types of things, but thinking in terms of objective driven marketing campaigns, that's different than just, Hey, let's throw traffic at the site and see what happens. And then mm-hmm. <laughs> you can tell I'm biased a little bit and then blame the marketing company because they didn't make me rich overnight. <laughs> right. Well, no one knows what you do <laughs> and your website is not designed in a way that converts. So there's a lot of other components that are that need to be set up for 
a marketing funnel to work well for a business to grow. Yeah. So that's the concept. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that I do on my own companies, just speaking from experience share, before I even do web design right out of the gate is I'll think about funnels. It's like, well, what am I, what am I really doing? What's our objective? I have 50,000 products. So that's way too much to try to sell to everybody. Even if I had the money, it's overwhelming. I don't want to have people have to click through a million different things on a website. What are my most profitable products? Let's pick like three. Mm -hmm. Let's create one specific landing page. And, and what is my lowest margin possible? Is this a recurring product? Is this something I could ship to them like vitamins every month or what have you, or a recurring service like cleaning uh, or mowing or whatever that might be. And if that's the case, statistically, do I think that if I can get 10 to 20 people in here, will they come back and buy from me again? Even if I break even, would I be willing to do that? And so if I come out of the, you know, out of the gate and, and they're looking for landscaping companies and I'm like, your first, your first mowing is free. If you sign up for 10 or this, that, or the other, or whatever the offer is, like nobody is doing that. And I know it, it sounds, it could sound foolish to some listeners. Well, of course I can give away things for free, but it's like, you'd be surprised. It goes a long way. And there's asterisks. You can, yeah, first mowing is free, but you're committing to 10, 30 day cancellation notice. And, and then, and it doesn't mean you're doing that for the whole world. You might just do that for 10 people. Just try it, right? Like go one step further than your competitors do and try it. And you might find five of those people stay with you for the next three years. You have a great business model now. So we use Go High Level. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? I have. Yeah, you have. Okay, great. Yeah. So we, we love, I, I love go high level. You can create like a microsite, drive people through one offer, automatically email responds, text responds. You can integrate apps, Twilio, et cetera. But I mean, that that's been a huge cost efficient thing. Uh, that's benefited a lot of small business that it's a great starting point because it helps your scalability. That's another way to make money. It's like, don't put yourself if you are the bottleneck at your company and you have to do everything, you've kind of, I don't know, if you're not thinking about that, you've already failed, right? Because mm. it's going to hit a roof and you left your full-time job to start your own business. And now you're working 80 hours a week instead of 40. So things to think about. <laughs> oh, there's so much wisdom in what you just said. <laughs> like there are so it's many big, nuggets yeah. there, right? Pain and experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, I think that's where, podcast episodes like this, the coaching that you do, that I do, I think that's where that comes in handy because what we do is we help other people to see the ditches so that they don't have to drive into them like we do. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yep. You know, I, I'm not going to live long enough to make all the mistakes myself. I'd like to right. avoid as many as I possibly can. And if yep. by learning from other people, I can avoid some of those, yeah. that's that's worth the price of admission. That's right. I mean, and and that's where I'm so grateful for for you being generous and willing to share those insights. So many things that I would love to follow up on. <laughs> like growing your business, like it's not just wave this wand, flip this switch, and all of a sudden, magically, everything is as you want it. Right. There's so many different components to it. Right. Part of it has to do too with the culture that you create. Yeah. As the leader, like as you add team members to help you with fulfillment, as you add people that are around you that you have influence with, they're looking to you as the leader now, but you're responsible primarily for culture. Yeah. So what are the main steps that somebody should take if they're the leader to create or improve the culture of their business? Or just back to experience share, mm. the there, there are different types of entrepreneurs and different types of successful business owners. And, and some of them are operational. Yeah. So that's your engineer who knows how to code and build some software and just crushes it, yeah. but has no idea how to hire people, scale them out, take what's in their brains and put it on paper for other people to follow process. Mm -hmm. They're going to fail at all that. And they may not even know finance, right? Yeah. And there's, there's business owners that are sales. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> so I thrive on relationships, education, and more. And, and so when you start thinking about culture, I'm like, oh, I'll just be myself. I'll be really nice to people and I'll encourage them to work hard. And, you know, it's what what's really underneath that is I don't know structure for that kind of stuff, or I didn't. And so I'm like, well, 
let's implement EOS. And, and by the way, there's coaching implementers scaling up. There's, there's a lot of these. We just happen to choose EOS. But for us, for me, I needed someone to give me an algorithmic system. You know, step one, let's determine the best people that work at your company. Pick the top three what are your favorite attributes about those people? Like if you could clone anyone at your company, who would yeah. you clone? Great. Sandy or David or whoever. It's like, cool. Write the top 10 favorite things about each of those people. Eliminate the duplicates. Take that list of 10 or 15 and try to simmer that down and consolidate into like five. And then it looks like, is it, are these our values? Like, is this who we really want to attract? And is this what we believe? And is this who we want to work here? And maybe there's some missing and, and that's okay. Cause you're bringing those, but really just putting it on paper and then defining who is it that we want to say yes and no to, and how do we want to hire and fire? And so that helps me like that structure structure is helpful. When you're a new business owner, you might know how to do your business, this culture, HR, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't, you know, that might not even make sense. I used to think, oh, I don't need culture. What are you talking about? I've never needed this stuff. I'm doing just fine. It's like, you should, because <laughs> like, maybe if you have five people, it's fine. But you start, you know, 20, 30, if you don't have alignment and culture, because you can't do it all yourself, you're going to need other people to also live what you live. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it'll kind of fall apart. So that's that's been really helpful for me just guidelines to start thinking about those things and and then grading those things each of your staff meet them you know once quarterly here's our five values did you get like a plus meaning like you you killed it you were the you live in the best values a plus minus meaning like yeah you did it 50 50 or a minus which by the way minuses aren't okay and this is the hard part about leadership is you might have somebody making you 50 percent of your revenue but they're the most toxic person at the company that's right person or that's wrong person, right seat. So mm -hmm. that's, if they don't meet your values, they have to go, you know what I mean? So that, that's the hard part. So it sounds like a little bit of experience talking there. That is it's pain and experience and expensive uh, mistakes. So mm. <laughs> learn <But> from me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I love that. And I, you're, you're spot on. And I, I love, you know, from the very beginning, when you talked about servant leadership, Everything that you have said has aligned with that, you know, from focusing on the customer that you're trying to reach, not the service you're trying to provide. You yeah. know, you're focusing on others. Oh, how can I best serve you? How can I best provide a service or value to the people that I'm trying to serve? From there, now creating culture, you're thinking about the employees, the team members and the culture and protecting that even yep. when it means somebody has to go. Yep. That servant leadership has just been woven throughout everything you've said, and I, I keep picking up on it. And it's so interesting that you call that out as as part of core to who you are. And I hear that in everything that you're saying. Yeah, it's um, consider all stakeholders. That's yeah. one of the best things to think about, because if if somebody is a high producer and they're toxic in your company, yeah. you know who else isn't going to want to work there? The rest of your staff. You're not right. being a good steward of them. <laughs> They hate their jobs every day because you won't do yours and get rid of the person that's, you know what I mean? It's Yeah, absolutely. It might sound extreme. You can put them through coaching or performance improvement plan, et cetera, et cetera. But end of day, like you need to protect your people. Like they're there for you. You know what I mean? Like they, they're there because they want to be there. They don't have to. It's a mutual agreement employment these days. So it's like, so, so with that being said, it's though that, that type of pain and that type of experience and, and servant leadership, like stuff is key and it's um for us crazy entrepreneurs a lot of us are quick starts we do have different levels of i i heard a ridiculous stat sometime but something like the top performers in the entire world the the heads of the biggest companies in the world it's like over 70 percent sociopathic behavior so it's like oh my we're, we're crazy a little bit I mean, <laughs> yeah, because we're taking risks that other people don't typically take but it yeah still have to exercise those people skills because it'll it'll help you tremendously and it'll make a better environment not only for your employees or your customers but your contractors and the community you serve and it's just better to try to focus on adding value uh to all those 
I think you're 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 spot on, Tyler. I, you know, I'm reading a book right now by Mark Miller called Culture Rules, and okay. it's uh, it's brand new. It just came out this month, and he's the vice president of high performance leadership at Chick Fil A. And okay. so he's writing from that perspective, and he talks about culture as something that a leader cannot delegate. That's right. You know how many times I have watched leaders try to delegate culture to another team member? Here, you're in charge of culture. You take care of that. No, um, right. You can't do it. You can't. No, you can have people push it and enforce it and live it, but you have to create it. You have to lead it. Yeah. And man, yeah, I will. I might take a look at that book because Chick fil A is doing something right, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and they're delicious. So <laughs> spot on. <laughs> yeah. So you you've moved from from entrepreneurship, well, from government to entrepreneurship and then into the investment space. Yeah. I'm curious, like of, of the investments that you have made, are there some that stand out that have been your favorites? Yeah. Yeah. Um, twofold. So, and this is more. What I, what I challenge business owners that I work with to think about, and these are people that I invest in, which is one of my favorite investments, by the way, is people. Um, and it is business too, but I like to invest in people first. If I know somebody who has concrete values, what does that mean? What it doesn't mean is they have to agree with everything I agree with based on insert anything here, political, religious, non whatever. I, I'm talking like core values that are absolutely necessary, true integrity, relentlessness, right? Like these things are important in business. If you give up after the first time, you're not the right fit. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to lie and steal, you're not the right fit. So like those things. And then if there's supplementary values that, that also align, great. Culturally, you guys will get along even better. But one of those things is like, if I, I look for those people who, who absolutely just have quality work ethic, because starting a business and running a business is extremely difficult. And it's easy to complain at an employee level about how things are going, but those people don't take the financial risks. Um, they, they just don't. And, and, and ironically, for anybody thinking like, man, I really want to start a business. I'm just really scared. It's like, for one, mentorship is key. Like if you can find a quality mentor who's already messed up, we've talked about this before, podcasts, YouTube, or in real life, and keep that relationship sacred. I always say this, do not ask them for money ever. Mm. Hey, I need money. Do you have any clients? Do you, you're going to ruin this. They're going to just kind of ignore you eventually because they don't need beggars, but they do get value. They, they get joy out of sharing experience because they want to help you avoid that. So like keep that as your Oracle professor. They're not a, they're not a purchaser of you. Mm. And if they offer someday, then awesome. Consider yourself blessed. Right. So, but Avoiding the pain and in, in, in through mentorship and in kind of pushing through that piece has, has benefited me substantially. Um, plus, especially in today's day and age, there's tons of free resources <laughs> like yes, this and, and more. And so investing in those people who may never had a chance, one of the latest acquisitions that we did in the business growth. And when I say never had a chance, they were capable. They could have, but, you know, it's not easy to go get a $150,000 loan. <laughs> Yeah. Like at all. It's not even easy to buy a house anymore. Um, yeah. So with that being said, you know, this individual had left their previous employment. They sold hot tubs and they were like, they're the best at hot tub sales. Actually, any sales. I think you know this person hmm. quite well and trust them, which is key <laughs> for anything I invest in. <laughs> but um, man, I was like, what does that look like if I funded your own company? And that looks like a new hot tub brand. Turns out I know how to grow companies, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Make websites, this, that, and the other. And by the way, I wasn't the maker to break it. Just to be super clear, like I didn't come in and save the day and just give this person a great experience. That person provided at least 60% of the value or more. I just provided the barrier values, right? Mm. The, I, I eliminated the barriers for that person to be the best version of themselves they could be. Uh, that person was a rock star before they even had this opportunity. So I provided the financing. We came up with the brand, created the website, ranked it in three months on Google, because as it turns out, if you have, <laughs> like, I'm not, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I, 
I'm going to obviously punch it as hard as I can. <laughs> and so I uh, did that, grew it to 2.6 million in two years. And here's why this is my favorite model. This is a little bit deeper, but when you have business partners, which here's a, a brief warning, by the way, if you're starting a company from scratch, do not be quick. And I know we, we in EO, we say, don't should all over people. You <laughs> should, you should, you should. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it. Do not give away a huge portion of your company because you're in the honeymoon phase and they're going to help you and you guys are going to be rich and say, you will regret that uh, months, if not years later. And it doesn't mean that that's a bad person. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't give away half, but it does mean you should seek counsel prior from mm -hmm. mentors who have done this and truly think about what is your one year, three year, five year plan, 10 year plan. Where will you be? What are your capability sets? And what does that look like? And because you're going to have a resentment <laughs> yeah. on, on all sides eventually. So that's good. Aside from that warning, in this case, a recipe that I found that works quite well is when you're a business owner, you split the profit. So yeah. in this case, I only took 35%. Why is that? Back to what I said, this person's already a rock star. They already know their trade. They're going to be working there literally seven days a week. I never worked there a day in my life, but I made sure we had the basics. We were growing. We had all the financing we needed. We got the lease I signed on. Like Some of that personal guarantee stuff, that risk that you do is just as worthy as the person working there. Hmm. And so at the end of two years, we facilitated here in the States an SBA 7A loan. Hmm. That means the government will actually give my business partner enough money to buy me out. And the cool part about that is, is this person now has 10 years to pay that loan off at an extremely low APR. It's cheaper for him to pay a loan off to buy me out than it would be to split profits with me. So it's a win-win wow. for everyone. So I, I, I remove barriers for a person who already has a capability to crush it and just couldn't, you know what I mean? It's yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff is not easy to do. And now their lifestyle has like three X. We've impacted family lineage. Mm. They're helping other people. He's already opened a second store now. Wow. That's my favorite kind of business with people. And to close, the second kind is just passive real estate investing with brokerages where I don't have to do anything. I don't make a lot of money from it, but I have to do nothing. <laughs> so like <laughs> that makes me more scalable because there's only one of me. So, yeah. you know, it's good to diversify. Hmm. You know, I love, I love the story that you told because you get, it seems just watching you, your body language, you get as much or more joy out of watching that person succeed. Totally. As you do succeeding yourself. Yeah, of course. It's about... I mean, there's tons of phrases on that. Like nobody wants to be rich alone. I'm not rich by the way, but it's like, share your success. Like, look, I didn't come from, <laughs> I'm not going to, I won't do that whole story, but like we were born in a, I was raised in a trailer in Nebraska. You know what I mean? And then, then I watched my dad and his work ethic and my mom too. We moved from a trailer to like a small house and then a small house to a bigger house. And then that house too, we built a home and like, mm -hmm. And I, I watched them elevate. Both of them are entrepreneurs. Both of them are type A's. Um, they ended up getting a divorce because I, I think that that both being type A's thing. <laughs> yeah, that's but like, but I mean, man, there's nothing better than watching that uh, happen right in front of you. And so, so when you can help friends, family, people that you trust that you know they have the potential, they just can't get past that next barrier. Like those are, I want to share that with people. Like that's the whole. You mentioned philanthropy. That's why I'm doing this. Like, great, I'm good at business. Different people are good at different things. I happen to be great at creating capital, but I redeploy that capital hundreds of thousands of dollars annually, anytime I can, 10% or more of my income to literally help people. And it's not so I can feel good about myself or tell about it on a podcast. It's measurable. And, and if you think of that multiplication effect, like what that does to the world, Man, what if everyone did that? Even people who don't run a business, you give five bucks to something, you know what I mean? To a cause. Yep. Incredible. It, it matters, you know? So, you know, the way I talk about that is that I believe there's no such thing as a wasted experience in your life. Yeah. And the experiences that you have that I have, they're not just for us. 
but not just for our benefit. The question is, will we be a reservoir of those experiences of the insight and wisdom that we gain there? Or will we be a conduit of it? And will we share it with those around us for their benefit? And what I love about what I'm hearing from you, Tyler, is that you are most assuredly that conduit in so many different ways. Advice, insight, wisdom, financial resources, the investments that you make in all of those areas and more are for the benefit of those around you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I I think that's the most re- rewarding life you could live, right? It's, I don't know. I, I know it sounds weird. And when you have nothing, that's really hard to think about, by the way, like I've been there too. And it's like, great. I'd love to give to people and help people. I can't even pay my own bills, right? Mm, yeah stewardship like you have to take care of yourself first and your family first but after that it's like regardless take down the veils politics religion all the things like whatever you believe is a barrier for you helping someone across the aisle it's like yeah get rid of that (laughs) and just help help people and that stuff comes around it really does and you don't you know you don't do it for the rule of reciprocity but Mm. uh, it's your life will be blessed because of that against your will it'll be really cool and it's hard to measure, you know, but it's yeah. like, it, so, yeah. Are there life lessons that you can share that, that you've hit along the way that you think, you know, these are some, these are some that are particularly meaningful that the leaders who are listening could benefit from as you're sharing so freely today? There's a lot. <laughs> you've and shared you, some already, no doubt. I know. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, one of the one of the biggest things again. Um, I mean, some of those snippets. Just a quick recap, and then I'll have new ones as well. But it's like, if you have a quality idea, don't give away half of your company before you've grown your crop. Yeah. Don't do it. Seek mentorship first, which is number two. Try to find mentors. I found out. I just found this out three years ago. The SBA has a program in the United States. Local SBA. They're volunteer retired, wildly successful business people. And they will literally meet you once a month for free coaching. Wow. Like what? This existed the whole time. (laughs) So (laughs) at minimum, even if it's an idea, you can do that. And they don't say no to people. They're just there to help. And you can stop whenever you want. You can start whenever you want. And it's like, get wisdom. You have to get wisdom. Listen to people. Listen to different perspectives. That's a huge thing. It's a pet peeve of mine. People lose out on so many opportunities because I keep referencing this, unfortunately, because of the time we're in, but like somebody has a different viewpoint than you do. We talked about Chick-fil-A earlier. Yeah. The people I'm in forum with would like cringe, oh, Chick-fil-A. And then they go on this rant and I'm like, you're going to discount one of the best fast food companies that came out of nowhere, almost dominates McDonald's Yeah. and has a phenomenal process because of something you heard on the news come on man like learn take the knowledge you're a big person you can do this you know like i almost want to pander him um but like learn from everyone be respectful to everyone they come from different experiences than you and and that that's like one of the biggest things both personally and from a business perspective act like you're in a video game and you're here to learn from everybody you're not joining a gang or or whatever your thing is like You don't need to subscribe to everybody you listen to, but like learn, man, because what you're only going to learn from your own echo echo chamber. Like you just limit yourself, you know? So I I just think overall from parenting to voting to anything business, like try to take in as much data as you can kill that ego. It's not going to serve you and, and find a really quality mentor who you don't ask for money from and they will just pour hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of MBA level education, real life experience, which can be better than books. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's like the best thing that, that I, I would recommend. Brilliant. Just brilliant. <laughs> Teachable spirit, the humility that is behind what you're saying there, not just on your behalf, but what you're recommending to the people who are hearing you right now. This is so critical. I, I call this the one non-negotiable of catalytic leadership is to cultivate intentionally a teachable spirit because yeah. you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you learn what not to do, but that oh, can be incredibly valuable. It can. Right? Why right. would I not learn that? Why would I not walk into every conversation, every situation and circumstance with that posture? What can I learn here? Yep. 
That's right. What can I learn? That's uh, Jordan Peterson actually says that. That's interesting. I try to listen to a lot of philosophers on both sides or what I would call modern day philosophers, but he's like, intently listen to even, even to people you disagree with and always yes. assume that there's something they know that you don't. Yes. So. Yes. So good. Well, yeah. So good. I'm curious if, if you could go back and talk to the Tyler who is just coming out of government service. What's the one thing you wish you could tell yourself? Just one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here's the one thing. Buy Bitcoin, sell at 65000 <laughs> Put your entire life savings into it. <laughs> then you don't have to learn business. You'll be a trillionaire. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> business. <laughs> Business-wise, it would likely be encouragement. Um, if I only had one thing that I could say, I would say, man, I would I would give them a glimpse. You will be successful in your endeavors. Continue to be relentless. It's going to be extremely difficult. But every, I don't even know, and that's kind of weird, but I don't know if I would tell myself to avoid the potholes because those are learning opportunities and, and I wouldn't have learned them otherwise. So it's more than anything, I'd probably just give myself encouragement. Like you're going to crush it, but it's going to be the hardest thing you do in your life. But find love in the race, not the win. Like it's not about crossing a finish line and getting something and then you're done. It's like, if you can fall in love with the race and the journey, you will be wildly more successful and less annoyed than if you're like, gosh, why have I still not made this much money yet? You know, comparison kills joy. So mm -hmm. it's, a, yeah, fall in love with your journey and don't, don't give up. I know it sounds generic, but like I, I would tell myself that. So, you know what I love about that answer is where you said, I would not warn myself about the potholes. Yeah. And I'd be mad at myself for that. Right. The younger me, why did you tell me this, man? Yeah. And then later I'd go, oh, that's why. <laughs> They're part of your story. They are. Yeah. They have, they have helped to make and create the person you are today. You would right. not be who you are without those failures. Right. That's right. Yep. Hopefully mm -hmm. people hear my voice too. Maybe someday I'll be like, when I was young, this was, you know, when I learned right now, there's still a little resentment, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I'm still feeling some of that pain, um, but it's kind of normal, I guess yeah. that's kind of just been a normal part of the journey. So mm, that's good. That's good. You're a continual learner, Tyler. And I can, I can hear that from how you're talking. Some of the things that you've said, is there a book that has made an impact on your journey? that you would recommend for leaders to put on their to read list? I know what you're asking and uh, my little mischievous humor. I should write one. Here's <laughs> the thing not to do. Don't screw up your life. Don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, books are easy resources to go find. And I have some and I can give those out with the caveat I've learned far more from personal experience share than I ever have from books. Mm. I would first or also encourage people who are planning on reading books to go out and speak with doers yeah. and people who are in it right now, find telling you find mentors and find people that are at the same stage you are, because it, it feels great to complain to someone who gets where you're coming from, because the more successful you become and the more pain you go through, you have to lay off half your staff. Your family doesn't understand that. <laughs> They're going to cheer you on. They're a cheerleader, but but you need people to tell you how, like it is. And really, and tell you if you're messing up. And you need somebody, you need to have trust for when those hard top conversations come up so your ego doesn't flare up. You shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, you don't want to be cheered off a cliff because you can. Your, your family and your friends, you could do it, man. Stay in there. Somebody's like, this is a terrible business. You need to change immediately or you're going to go bankrupt. Listen to them. Maybe it's like they're trying to help you, right? So outside of the experience or mentorship and finding what I would call like a tribe, um, I think, I, so I'm a huge efficiency fan. Uh, Atomic Habits. Yes. It's simple. 
but habit stacking is important. It's like, are you learning? Are you listening to podcasts like this one? Are you trying to get as much knowledge in your head as you can? When are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Because you're probably driving and that's a waste of time. So maybe you could listen to a podcast while driving and maybe you could do this while working out. Maybe so habit stacking is, is a really cool method worth practicing. And it, one of the things I like is like the 1% increase per yes. month per day. And it's like, well, that's not a lot. What if I did one push up a day? That's 365 more a year than you've ever done. So, you know, and, and that matters. I mean, we already know like the exponential effects of, um, you know, putting money in bonds or what have you. Um, just that APR increase and the interest earned. Maybe bonds are a bad example now, but you get it. It's like that stuff matters over time. So Atomic Habits uh, and then anything by Jim Collins. Mm, oh, so true. <laughs> so he's out of Boulder too, which I, I actually didn't know. So I guess he's up here like an hour away from me, but um, from good to great, great by choice, like just really good concepts and a lot of distilled research into a story format that's easily digestible. I'm a huge fan of the audiobooks. Yes. Um, so anyway, yeah, those would be the, uh, the two. Brilliant. As we wrap up, I know our listeners are going to want to stay connected with you, Tyler, and continue to learn from you. What is the best way for them to do that? Right now, the best way is LinkedIn, not to communicate with me, but just to stalk me and see where I'm working and what I'm working on because, I, and, and here's why it's like, Somebody might hear this podcast five years later from now yeah. and and I might have a different title or a different role or be in a different company. You don't know. Right. Yeah. So um, so that's something just in general. But with the caveat, I get 150 plus in mail messages. LinkedIn is just a spam platform. I don't even check them. I have like an auto bot sometimes. It's like, hey, just email me or I don't know. So that that makes it a little difficult. But creative thinkers will go, oh, he works at this company. Let's send a contact form at this company. The easiest way right now and where I'll be for the next couple of years easily is uh, Tyler at nuclearnetworking.com. And that's my direct email. It's not a company email. Happy to meet you, learn about your journey. If you're starting a company, if you want to be bought, sold, funded, built, marketed, I, I love those conversations. So. So fantastic. Tyler, thank you for your generosity today. You've been so helpful to so many people. And I can't wait for our listeners to learn from you in this episode. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for joining me for this episode today. As we wrap up, I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to discover this podcast. Second, if you don't have a copy of my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I'd love to put a copy in your hands. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, you can get a copy for free. Just pay the shipping so I can get it to you and we'll get one right out. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This book captures principles that I've learned in 20 plus years of coaching leaders in the entrepreneurial space, in business, government, nonprofits, education, and the local church. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm currently learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take a next step with a coach to help you intentionally grow and thrive as a leader, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to catalyticleadership.net to book a call with me. Stay tuned for our next episode next week. Until then, as always, leaders, choose to be catalytic. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? Go to catalyticleadership.net. <laughs>